Good morning. In Mitch's absence this morning, Mitch is in vacation with his family in Florida this week, so uh, hopefully everything's going well with them. Kent Allen was supposed to be here this morning. Uh, he called in sick, uh, so uh, we have an emergency. This is Charlie Kimes right here. We all know Charlie Kimes. <laughs> Charlie just, Charlie just got back from vacation. He's been in San Diego, I guess, all week. And uh, he got back last night. This morning he woke up at 7 o'clock with a, with a call. So uh, Charlie's a little nervous this morning. Uh, I'm kind of nervous for him, to be honest with you. <laughs> I would be nervous. But we know Charlie, and we know Charlie's going to do a great job. So, so this morning Charlie's uh, filling in for... Uh, uh, Kent, who was filling in for Mitch, so here's Charlie. <laughs> oh, Charlie. I'll be speaking off the cuff mostly this morning, and I get in a lot of trouble when I speak off the cuff. Jesus came with his disciples to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they say, well, some say you're John the Baptist or Jeremiah or Elijah or one of the prophets. And Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the blessed. And Jesus says, you've spoken the truth. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom. We know that in Acts 2 that Peter was given the keys of the kingdom. And he began to preach about how they had crucified Christ, who was both Christ and Lord, Savior and and master you see the Lord had a dream for the church his dream that would was that the church would be so strong that the gates of hell could not stop its growth you see the Lord had a dream for a church that would be so powerful and so strong that the whole world would know about him now I too have dreams like you do. But my dream and your dream is to have the dream that Jesus had. And there's some things that we know that must happen for us to fulfill that dream that Jesus had. First of all, we know that we must be, because we are the army of the Lord, the family of God, the vineyard of the Lord. Because we are not just a family, but we're a spiritual family, a spiritual body, a spiritual army, then we must be people that are totally immersed in being spiritual. Now, a spiritual person is not just something that's a figment of our imagination. A spiritual person has his mind on spiritual things. That's what we think about. We think about God, we think about Jesus, we think about heaven. We think about souls that need to be saved. That's what our whole heart is about. You know, in Galatians chapter 4, the apostle Paul wrote to the churches of the province of Galatia. And he said to them, I'm like a mother in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. In other words, Paul said, I want Jesus to live in your hearts. And that's what a spiritual person is. You see, we don't think like the world thinks. Our desire is not to be happy, not to be pleasurable, not to have money. Now, it's all right to have money. It's all right to have pleasure. It's all right to be happy. But you see, our main goal is not to have these things. You see, happiness is a serendipity. 
It's what we get when we pursue Jesus, when we let Jesus live in us. Because happiness is not based upon our circumstances. It's based upon our relationship with Christ. And if me to live is Christ, then I have that inner peace, that inner joy that no matter what happens to me, no matter what circumstance I'm in, I have Jesus living in me as my Savior and Lord. You see, this spiritual nature that I have is because I died when I obeyed the gospel. We've been baptized into Christ. We were buried. We died. We no longer live after the flesh. We live after the spiritual things. We died to that life. And that's, that's something that's ongoing. It doesn't mean that we have everything together. We still have problems. We have hurts. We have marital problems. We have financial problems. But we are striving to live our lives so that people might see Jesus living in us. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and bring glory to God. Now, why do they bring glory to God when they see the light of Jesus? Because it's not our light. They don't see us. They see Jesus living in us. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever we eat, drink, whatever we do, we do it all to the glory of God. That's what we are about, being a spiritual entity that lives to bring glory and honor to God. It doesn't matter if we are healthy or sick or got a good job or a bad job. We, we're a bad marriage. Whatever it is. We are here to let Jesus be seen in our life to bring him glory. We are a spiritual entity. We, we, we think on the spiritual things. We seek first the kingdom of God. That doesn't mean it just first, it's first, second, last. It's forever in our life. Our hearts and our minds are on the things that bring glory and honor to God. We set our affections on things above, not on things of this earth. We have learned that we're not to be conformed to this world, but we're transformed. We're, we're letting people see Jesus in, and one of the reasons we come together today is just to encourage each other to look like Jesus, to have that servant spirit, if there's any metaphor that describes Jesus and ought to describe a Christian, is that of a servant. And I don't know of any greater servants. I've been coming to church here for a couple of years now. This is a serving church. This is a church where everyone tries to see themselves looking like Jesus. And you never look more like Jesus than when you serve. And we've got different entities doing different things. But whatever it is, we're trying to let people see that Jesus lives in us, that we've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who I know loved me and gave himself for me. You see, we don't see things like the world sees things. We, we don't see life and death like the world sees life and death. For us to live is Christ, to die is gain. We, we know our purpose. We know where we're going. We know that we're, our goal in life is to hear the words, I fought a good, I hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, because we fought that good fight. We've finished the course. We've kept the faith. That's what life is about. It's like a vapor that's here, then it's gone. And we kind of get the idea that, wait a minute. It's all right to have money, but let's use it to the glory of God. It's all right to do things, but to recreate ourselves, to refresh ourselves. 
It's all right to have a great happiness, but the happiness is not based upon our different circumstances of life because it will just be like that. But it's based upon Jesus living in us and our setting affections on things above and not on the things of this world. That's why we're living. See, we got two choices. Either to live to please ourselves, and that's the world, and that's the devil, and that's Satan. Or we live to please God, live to be spiritual. And as a Christian, as one who has said, I want Jesus to come and live in me. I want to show him that I love him. I want to show that I appreciate what he did for me on that old rugged cross. And therefore, I'm going to give my life to him. I'm going to die to self in baptism. And I'm going to rise and I'm going to walk a new life. A life that I'd never lived before. And sometimes we need to be reminded of that new life we have. We need to be reminded that we set our affection on spiritual things. In John 8, Jesus said, I do always those things that please him, speaking to God. In 2 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul says, we make it our goal to please him. When Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, he says, live as children of light. That means that light that you have is Jesus living in you. And find out what pleases the Lord. Now, one of the things that we do as a church is we find out what pleases the Lord, and we do those things. We know that we need to put him first in our life. We know that we want to do those things that will bring him glory. You see, a spiritual church is one who knows or tries to find out, and they live to find out what pleases the Lord. And here it is, it tells us in here, we've got to know the Bible, we've got to read it, we've got to study the Bible, we've got, we've got to, the truth is important, thy word is truth, and, and it's not enough, brethren, just to know the Bible. You know, the truth by itself can be hard, it can be condescending it can be covetous it can be dogmatic it can be judgmental I know the Bible and I'll tell you what and they use it they use it to just cut people up but brethren I'm told that I am to preach the truth in love I am told that when I have love with the truth I can take that truth that's, that sometimes people use to look down on people and think they're better than everybody else. And I can use a love that by itself is surpy and, and holds nothing because it's just like water. It goes through the hand. But I combine both of them, truth and love together. I get the knowledge of the truth that lets people know how much I love them and how much Jesus loves them. I believe that one of the best definitions of Christianity is found in Galatians 5 or 6. Where Paul says, it doesn't matter if you're circumcised or not circumcised. That doesn't matter. Here's the only thing that matters. Is a faith that expresses itself through love. Isn't that what Christianity is? We just express our faith through love you see your knowledge of the truth isn't going to save you we try to live it out we we just can't talk the talk and I don't know of any church that tries to walk the walk any more than this church you've got elders that oversee this church that love this church you got a preacher that preaches the truth and love every single Sunday. 
You have a man who loves the Lord. He's the real deal. He's the real thing. You've got people that are, see themselves as servants that go out and they teach and they preach. They serve. And yet, we're filled with people who have hurts and habits and hang-ups. We all have things in our life that, that are burdensome. But you see, we see all of that as a way to bring glory to God. Our, our hope is not in this world. Our hope is not in this world. And we believe the sufferings of this world is not worthy to be compared with the glory that we'll have in the hereafter. And that's the way we try to live our life. We try to be a spiritual entity. And our affections and our thoughts and our minds on those spiritual things that will bring glory to God. And the second part, I've already worked into the first part, but the second part is not only are we trying to be a spiritual church we're trying to be a church that loves one another the way I understand it we only have two things to do two things I think Jesus spelled it out in Matthew 22 when someone asked him what's the greatest commandment and he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment, he said. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as yourself. You see, I have two things to do. I have to love God, and i got to love one another. Now, love God, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. We, we do those things, as we have already said, that tries to please God. We want to do that. We love him. In Christianity, it's just loving him back. That's, we just, that's, Jesus tells us how to love him in his word. He tells us how to respond to that love of the cross. When he gave himself as a sacrifice for us. The only way that the sin could be removed was through Jesus Christ. And he did that because he loved us. In John 13, the night before Jesus was betrayed, Jesus wanted them to know some of the most important things that he ever taught. He wanted them to know what was of utmost importance. And we know what he did. He, he washed their feet and he says, I've given you example to do as I have done to you. He wanted to show them his love. And then he said, after that, I want to give you a new commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. Now, the, the new part was not to love. They were already told that. But to love like I love you. And by this will all men know that you are my disciples. How do people know? By the love you have one for another. You see, as Christians, we come from many different backgrounds, different colors, different sides of the railroad track. We have different jobs. Some wear a tie, some don't wear a tie. I tried to look like Mitch today where you wouldn't know I didn't wear a tie. <laughs> well, 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 that's what I say too. We live in an increasing apathetic world. We live in a world that surrounded by indifference, even cruelty. And we just kind of shake our head 
But you see, out of that comes a body of people that just love each other so much. Now, we're even told how to love each other. You know all the one another passage of Scripture that we're told? Alilon is a Greek word there. It says we serve one another, we greet one another, we encourage one another, we are members of one another, we're devoted to one another, we forgive one another. It's all about our being involved in each other's lives. There are a lot of broken hearts here. I teach the, uh, we call it the young at heart class. Uh, it's all of us that are really, really young. <laughs> For a while, I preached, I taught on uh, angels, and we call it Charlie's Angels class. We like that the best of all. But I don't even know what I was talking about. <laughs> we, Roy and Bill are two of the elders that are in there. I, Roy doesn't come most of the time. He's out, but I, don't, I won't say that publicly. But, uh, <laughs> but Bill said, you know, Charlie, you can't believe all the hurts and pains that are here. You know, I've preached for a long time. I do understand. You know, sometimes you have to smile to keep from crying. People come here, there's cancer, there's, there's problems in their home, there's problems at work, there's personal problems. But you know, one of the reasons we come here is to encourage each other and build each other up and put our arms around each other and says, I love you with the love of the Lord. You see, we've come here to let people know they're loved. Not only do we love them, but the Lord loves them. When Paul wrote that great chapter on love in 1 Corinthians 13, he didn't write that just to give a discourse on love. That's what they needed. That's what the church needed. There was so much disunity in the church, so much false doctrine, but more than anything else, they needed to know how much the Lord wanted them to love him and love one another. And it's agape love. It's not a feeling love. You don't have to feel love towards someone, but you have to act love. You see, God doesn't command emotions. He commands actions. And when you look at 1 Corinthians 13, whether love is patient and love is kind and is not boast, is not rude, not selfish, and all those other adjectives, they're, they're not feeling words, they're action words. Remember we said in Galatians 5 or 6, a faith that works, that expresses itself through love. In Ephesians 5. Paul says, as dearly loved children, because you're loved so much, you live a life of love. You see, we're here this morning because all the world, out all the chaos, that they want to find a place where they can feel love, where their herd habit or whatever they have, is eating at their soul. They can find comfort. They can find people that are trying to be like Jesus and want to serve them and help them in any way they can. And there's no place in the world where they are to find more love and can find more love right here in this congregation. Amen. That's what we're about. We're about trying to express our love, trying to bear each other's burden trying to help a brother up. You see, the only, we never bend our hand down to point at anyone. We put our hand down to pick them up. And that's this kind of church that we live in right here in this church. We're trying to pick each other up because we're all going to heaven and we're just trying to grab each other's arms and hands and hearts and love each other all the way there. 
Let me tell you something else, the third point. Not only are we going to be a spiritual church and also a church that loves God and each other, but we're a church that tries to tell others about Jesus Christ. I think we've done a pretty good job of restoring the church, the worship, the organization, things like that, salvation. But when we talk about restoring Christianity, I think the main thing, even more important than the church, even though the church is so important, it's the saved. But we need to restore the place where Jesus ought to be in our hearts. Brethren, we're not converted to a church. We're converted to Jesus Christ. And when people ask us what we need to do, we don't need to say, well, here's what our church teaches. It doesn't matter what the church teaches. It matters what Jesus says. It's a matter of our loving Jesus and doing what Jesus wants us to do. It's Jesus that saves. When, when the first gospel sermon was preached, they were added to the church when they obeyed the gospel. What did he preach? He preached Jesus was crucified for them. He died for them. And they said, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized. And Acts 8, what did Philip do when he went to the city of Samaria? He preached Jesus. What did he do when he preached the Ethiopian eunuch? He preached the good news about Jesus. What did Paul and Silas preach in Acts 16 when the jailer says, What must I do to be saved? He just said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. They didn't know what to believe about. He didn't know what to believe about Jesus. And he spoke unto him what to believe. I'm surely he told him about how Jesus died on the cross. He's the Savior of the world. He shed his blood. And no wonder the same hour of the night he was baptized because they told him how to love Jesus back. How to appropriate the blood that was shed on the cross so that he could be forgiven. And he was baptized that night. Coming to Jesus is the beginning of our journey. But the rest of the journey is to tell people about Jesus and what he's done for us. That's what we do. We tell people about Jesus and he's our life. He is the author. He's the source of our salvation. And we love him because he first loved us. And when we understand that, then we'll say, how can I love you? You see, when John saw Jesus, the Baptist saw him, he said, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's who Jesus is. And that's what we do. There are no, many noble pursuits in this world, but none match the pursuit of telling people about Jesus Christ. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And there needs to be a burden on our heart for souls that heaven had the blood of Jesus wash away their sin. I'm thankful to be a part of a church that tries to be spiritual, that tries to set their affection. A church that loves each other and loves God. And a church that sends out people almost every week somewhere telling people about Jesus and they send them out right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and let people know that Jesus loves them. And we want people to know that he's our Savior and our Lord and our Master. And the only thing in life worth living 
is a life that's lived for the Lord to bring Him glory and honor. If you need the prayers of this church in any way, we want to love you. We want to help you. If you need to obey the gospel of Christ, to put on the Lord in baptism, if you need to be a part, want to be a part of this loving, caring, spiritual church that wants to save souls, the church is trying to stay in that path where the Lord will say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. We want you to come while again we stand, while we sing. Yes.